If you've spent weekends stuffing corners with oversized base traps, measuring, shifting panels around, but there's that 70 hertz crater that still glares back at you from the frequency plot, then this video is for you. Let's talk about why absorption can feel like magic on peaks, but helpless on nulls, and how to flip that script. Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. By the way, if you're new here, alongside these videos, I run hands-on courses like Build a Better Bass Trap to help you craft deep bass traps to actually hit 40 hertz while keeping the room lively, as well as absorber placement hacks for odd rooms to help you pinpoint absorber placement in awkward rooms, and of course, my acoustic treatment essentials bundle to pull it all together. So if that's interesting to you, I've put the links to all of these in the description. But getting back to the topic, I want to answer an email subscriber's question on targeting deep dips with absorption. By the end of this video, you'll know why peaks and dips tend to move together, where to place treatment, and when to stop chasing measurements. So here's the question from this email subscriber, and it's pretty simple. He said, I know absorption can reduce peaks in the bass response, but will it also remedy nulls? How can I target dips when selecting DIYing acoustic treatment for my room? So in a way, he's asking whether he can really fill that, let's say, 70 hertz dip with absorption somehow, or if he's stuck with it. And I totally get that. I used to think this as well. Peaks and dips seem to feel like separate monsters, but let's bust that myth. And in a nutshell, the answer is both peaks and dips are basically two sides of the same coin, be it whether they are created by standing waves, room modes, or reflection-induced interference. So if you add enough deep absorption in the right spot, in, t in terms of the standing wave that will damp that standing wave. And so both the peaks will come down and the dips will come up. And if it's a reflection-induced interference, which typically causes a comb filter, which in itself also comes with peaks and dips, basically the same principle applies, right? You stop that reflected energy from interfering with the direct signal. That comb filter doesn't get created or at least is reduced in its energy. And so you end up bringing up the dips and reducing the peaks. So of course the question then becomes, how do you figure out what is actually causing that dip in order to find the right cure, the right, right placement for your absorption? And that's where it becomes slightly more tricky. There are basically three types of acoustic effects that can cause dips in the low end. And the first one I just talked about that's standing waves, room modes, resonances typically between two parallel walls. So the way to figure this out, if you're using measurements, for example, is if you measure along the propagation axis of this standing wave, if you measure a certain number of spots along that, let's say, length of the room, what you should see is the frequency of that dip staying the same but the amplitude changing. So the dips coming up, the peaks coming down, depending on where you position the microphone. And that's simply because you are at a different point of the cycle of that standing wave and the interference between one wave going one way and the reflected wave going the other way and those two then interfering, right? So depending on where you are in that cycle, you'll get more or less interference causing more or less reduction or amplification in uh, the frequency response. The second type is a standard mirror point reflection, right? So sound bouncing off of a certain surface in your room and then bouncing back to your listening position, the microphone at your listening position, creating a comb filter. And to figure out if that's the case, you would typically look at the impulse response or the energy time curve. And that will basically show you a peak when that reflected energy arrives back at the microphone. And then based on the time delay of that peak relative to the direct sound, you can then infer what frequency is affected and basically where that comb filter sits and where that dip 
is caused in the frequency response. And so that's when you, how you can figure out if it's a mirror point reflection. The third type of acoustic effect that can, that can cause a low frequency dip is typically speaker boundary interference, SBIR, often abbreviated to. And this is basically a, 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 a reflection as well, but the energy doesn't get reflected back to the listening position, it gets reflected back to the speaker. And so that's what makes it trickier to identify because since the energy isn't reflected back to the microphone, it doesn't actually appear as a peak in the impulse response in the time domain. It only appears as that dip in the frequency response. And if you then measure, let's say, again, along the length of the, length of the room at different points in the room, that dip won't change because it is created at the speaker membrane and it's independent of the position of the microphone. So those are three ways that you can potentially identify which effect is happening. And as you can already tell, it's pretty difficult to actually do that. In practice, it becomes even more difficult because all these effects sit on top of each other and it can become very convoluted and difficult to dissect and figure out what is what. And that's why as a much more practical and effective approach, I always recommend a shotgun style approach to treating your room. Basically, you're trying to get rid of all these effects based off of first principles, and then you measure to see if anything remains. And hopefully by that time, once you've gotten rid of most of these effects, those that remain will stand out more and be more easily identifiable. So then once you've hopefully correctly identified which effect is causing a particular dip, how do you then treat that dip? Well, in the case of room modes, standing waves, it's simply a matter of damping that particular resonance, right? So let's say if it's a front to back mode, then you want to follow the principle of placing your absorption, your porous absorption in a maximum of particle velocity. So this is that quarter wavelength rule that you might have heard about, placing absorption there in enough depth to actually reach those low frequencies and with enough surface area will then damp that standing wave, bring the peaks down and the nulls up. In terms of the two reflection effects, mirror point reflections and speaker boundary interference, it's a matter of identifying the surface where that reflection happens and then placing your absorption there to catch that reflected energy, again, with enough depth for that absorption to work at the frequency that is causing that dip or where the dip appears. And then you can stop that energy, stop it interfering with the direct sound, which removes or reduces the comb filter and in turn brings the nulls up and the peaks down. Then obviously the next question is how deep is deep enough for your absorption? Well. This is where it's slightly less intuitive than you'd think, but you actually need somewhere along the lines of somewhere between 12 to 20 inches of total absorption depth to get down to somewhere between 50 to 100 hertz of absorption. So that's a lot more than people tend to be able to sacrifice or to want to sacrifice. But if you're asking for the ideal solution, then that's what it takes. And of course, the air gap can play a role in increasing your absorption in the low frequencies or on the flip side, using less material for the same effect. I'm not gonna go into detail on that right now, but I've linked a video in the card that you can check out where I go into full detail to explain how to really leverage the power of an air gap behind your absorption material. Of course, as always, if you're wondering whether treatment or messing with your speaker positioning and listening position is the better idea to get rid or reduce a certain peak that appears in your frequency response, the rule of thumb is to always, always, always focus on really nailing down your listening position and your speaker placement first. Yeah, it's basically free improvement, free treatment in a way, yeah, to really get a balanced low end response, a full proper balanced stereo image and Basically, if you're wondering whether you should invest in treatment to get rid of an effect or if you should invest time in refining your listening position, it's quite simple. If you haven't followed my procedures on how to identify the proper listening position in your room and set up your speakers, if you haven't done that yet, 
then that's absolutely what you should focus on first. And if you want some guidance on that, you can download my home studio treatment framework completely for free, which I've also linked in the description. And then finally, why not just use EQ, right? Speaker equalization, room calibration, compensation systems, whatever you want to call them. And again, the same rules apply that I've talked about many times. You basically want to use EQ because it is useful in most home studios, but as a final touch up, right? It comes with that compromise of added latency. And usually if you're boosting into your speakers, reduced headroom, right? So you can't play the music as loud from your speakers. You're basically stealing volume from your speakers. And so in order to minimize that, you wanna use that as the last step in the chain of treating your room. But it is a useful tool, it is at hand, so you might as well use it. Just don't rely on it fully. First, listening and speaker placement, then treatment, then EQ. So to recap, peaks and dips are always two sides of the same coin, no matter what effect is actually causing them, be it standing waves, mirror point reflections, or speaker boundary interference effects. And so if you get rid of those effects, you will reduce or get rid of the induced interference, which then brings up the nulls and reduces the peaks. I hope that makes sense. And thanks for this email subscriber for this question. If you have any questions, make sure you sign up to my email list as well. And with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.